everyone, it's Holly and I'm here with another smash or trash video where we talk about retellings and adaptations of a popular story or fairy tale. And this time we're going to talk about Persuasion by Jane Austen. So Persuasion, if you didn't know, is definitely my favorite Austen. I've read it so many times. <laughs> I love it so much and there are not nearly enough retellings and adaptations, especially adaptations. <sighs> it's so sad. <clears throat> so for retellings, we're going to talk about three. So we're going to talk about For Darkness Shows the Stars, which is a YA novel by Diana Peter Freund. Freund. I still don't know how to say her name after all these years and this is one of my favorite books. <laughs> that's embarrassing. The Stars We Steal by Alexa Dunn, which is also YA. This is like sci-fi, I think. And Recipe for Persuasion, which is adult romance, but I see it more as women's fiction, kind of, sort of. It's like a little right there. And then for adaptations, we're going to talk about two, a, the 1995 adaptation and the 2008 adaptation. Both of these are period piece adaptations. They're not anything like new and different unfortunately but that's what it is Ooh. and now let's talk about the source material okay so now we're going to talk about the background information on persuasion so by this i mean talking about core story points <clears throat> and situations things that i always remember and big themes so like i do with all of these i did a little bit of research so this isn't just my perception and actually I recently started watching YouTube recommended to me um, <clears throat> a doctor her name is Dr. Octavia T Cox and she has a couple of videos about persuasion actually and I thought they were really interesting and they Murphy can you stop please and they did kind of change my perception on some things so <clears throat> or like open my eyes to things that like I always felt while reading Persuasion, but I never understood why I felt that way. So Persuasion, if you didn't know, is a story. <laughs> so it is by Jane Austen. It is one of her more popular books, I feel like. I feel like there are a group of people who really like Persuasion. Like me, it is my favorite Austen. Um, although every time I read Northanger Abbey, it like sneaks up there. Um, not gonna lie. <laughs> so, uh, but Persuasion is a second chance romance and it is about Anne Elliot who eight years ago fell in love with Frederick Wentworth and they got engaged and then she was persuaded by her family and family friends that this would be a poor match for her and so she broke off her engagement and he left. And he was heartbroken, she was heartbroken, and now we here we are eight years later. And her family is poor, and like all her dad cares about is appearance and money and being somebody in society. They end up renting out their home, and she goes and stays with her sister, I believe it is. And through all of this, new people come to town, and she ends up reuniting with Wentworth and they kind of have to face their old interactions. Not everybody in her life knows about her relationship with Wentworth. He's not sharing it with everybody and they're now put in these difficult, sometimes awkward and angsty situations. And um, there's a lot of like society meetings and everything. I think a lot of people think of persuasion as a second chance romance. Like that's one of the main things I always think about it. And then persuasion is obviously a large part of the story. So you have this idea of being persuaded and persuading other people. So Anne is persuaded by her family and family friends who she really respects um, in order to make what she think is, thinks is the best decision societally, even though she loves Wentworth she's persuaded and honestly like it makes complete sense like you would love to think that you would just like buck tradition and everything but things were hard and things were very hard back then for women they didn't have a lot of options and so to basically lose everything potentially just for love is a hard choice to make so <laughs> I don't hate Anne for the decision that she makes I do understand 
Boy Wentworth is mad about it, but I understand her decision. Something that I didn't realize until I was watching these videos by Dr. Octavia Cox, which I'll leave links to the videos down below, is I had literally never thought about this. <laughs> and I've read this book like five times. Anne and Wentworth like rarely talk to each other. Rarely do they talk to each other. Um, I think it was in that video. It might have been something I read online. But either way, somebody pointed out that like compared to Pride and Prejudice, where like you have so many conversations between Darcy and Lizzie, like this is the complete opposite. Now you still feel like you know these characters, you still feel like you understand them and you see where they're coming from, you get their thought process and you completely buy into their romance with each other but they rarely ever speak to each other and that is impressive <laughs> when you think about it um also a lot of this story what you're doing is you are going through like what Anne is going through so like there are moments you are literally in her head as she is figuring things out and trying to figure out how she feels about the things that are exposed to her and I had never thought about that before, that that is what Austin is doing. And that is why I feel so emotionally invested in this story and in these characters and I care so much about them. And I think it really is an integral part of this story. And I think Austin was one of the first authors to start doing this. And this is something you see a lot more now and it's almost expected in a lot of ways, but it wasn't then it's it's beautiful <laughs> I did want to talk about some of the other like characters or plot points that stand out to me so I already talked about Sir Walter who is Anne's dad he's very like he cares about society and money um her sister Mary she also cares about expectations and uh what people expect of you um I feel I've always thought of this book as kind of angsty in the writing and to me that is like part of what it is. Um, there is a letter from Wentworth at the end that is just beautiful. I think it's a defining moment of this book. I think it's a defining feature of it too for a lot of readers. Um, she does have a family friend, Lady Russell, who is part of the, is one of the people who persuades her not to marry Wentworth. And she is present throughout the story. And I, to me personally, like one of the things about Lady Russell is unlike a lot of the people in Anne's family, I think Lady Russell does care about Anne. And she doesn't persuade her from like a bad place. She really is looking out for her best interest. And I think that's an important part of her character. So yeah, I don't think I have much more to say. I don't know. That's some background information and some stuff that I will probably touch on as we're going through these retellings. So let's get into the retellings. Hi, so now we're going to talk about The Stars We Steal by Alexa Dunn. This is a YA sci-fi story and um, it is explicitly a persuasion retelling. I think it's it was pitched as like persuasion meets The Bachelor. And um, Alexa Dunn is a YouTuber. Um, she does author too. I subscribe to her. I do really like her. I think she is a great author tuber. And I think she does a lot for the community. And I really like her insight on things like publishing because obviously I know nothing about it really, but she has an inside look. Um, and I think all or at least the majority of this book was written while she was on AuthorTube and I know she has videos about the experience but I've kind of avoided watching them until after I had read the book because I didn't want them to like influence me in any way <laughs> um, or potentially be spoiled so I had avoided those videos. Um, this book did come out last year in 2020 and it's her second book so it's her sophomore novel. I have not read her first book so this is my first book by her and I did give it three stars. So um, what this is, is you have um, Leo, she is your Anne Elliot character, and this takes place in space. Why does humanity live in space? I don't know. That is never explained to us. 
I feel like you can just assume something happened to Earth so people escaped to space. So now you have like these main families. So she's a princess, um, like a Scandinavian princess, I believe. Um, I just can't remember what country. Um, but so like all of these like royalties have their own ships and then you have countries who have their own ships and everything. Mainly you spend time with uh, Leo and her family, but you do briefly go to like other ships and stuff. And so that's kind of how society is structured and things are not the best as happens, you know, when you've been in space for like 100, 200 years, um, things start to fall apart, that kind of thing. And her family is losing money and her father, all he cares about is appearances and money and he wants his daughter to get married to somebody rich. And in their society, they have this thing, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's like Volg or Volg. I feel like it probably has a very specific pronunciation because I'm assuming it's a Scandinavian word. Um, but it's basically a like a month long dating extravaganza where you have all these eligible young men and women coming together and trying to date um, and find matches. And then there's like a big ball at the end where they announce their engagements. And so um, her dad wants her to find somebody and get married. And um, her sister is also taking part in this, although she is like 16, so she's a little younger. Um, and Leo wants nothing to do with this. She's, you know, she is like a scientist kind of, and she wants to do other things to help her family and to help her ship. And like nobody wants to help her or support her. Um, she had several years earlier been secretly engaged to Elliot Wentworth um who worked with her family and worked for her, like his dad worked for their family but she was persuaded to break off their engagement and he left and so now when they rent out their ship for this season in order to make money uh Wentworth comes back with the people who are renting the ship so they're reunited he takes part in this dating extravaganza they have to deal with stuff there are some like political things going on in here too um it never felt like this story like fully connected to honestly either the romance or like the sci-fi political elements like it felt like both were given like half treatment and so neither plot really felt fully fleshed out in my personal opinion as a book is what it is not every book works for every person so as a persuasion retelling I think this is very obviously a persuasion retelling um, I don't think every second chance romance is a persuasion retelling. I want to be very clear about that. Um, but this does have a second chance romance. Obviously, Alexa Dunn pulls names here from the source material. Um, she kind of plays around with them, which I think is a good idea. I'm not a big fan when retellings just do like straight name pulls. Um, I think it just ties you too much to the source material. It makes it harder for things to be individual to you because you should still make it your own. Um, there is that persuasion element, the engagement and the breaking apart. Um, it is strongly built on lack of social standing and lack of money on Wentworth's part. Um, and he comes back wealthy, which is what happens in the source material. And he definitely has a bitterness towards Leo, which again is very strong in the original one. Um, her father character, I can't remember his name in the stars we steal but he is very similar um she does have family who plays a role she doesn't really have that like i guess her sister kind of plays the role of lady russell in a way in that her sister is actually pretty supportive she doesn't know everything about leo's life but um i actually really appreciated that relationship if i'm gonna be honest i liked it with like positive siblings and there is a letter element i don't think it's anywhere near as good as Wentworth's OG letter, but that's a high bar. Um, so some differences, like I said, her sister is a little bit of a different character. You don't have all of the characters showing up, which I think is fine. I don't think you need every side character and every plot point or anything like that. Um, there is a ton more talking in here. So Elliot or Leo <laughs> and Elliot um, actually talk to each other quite a bit and they talk about like not only do they just interact with each other, they talk about their relationship, like how it failed and 
like the potential of going forward as friends and things like that so you do have a lot of that in there and that is something you definitely don't have in the source material there is also that outside political plot so you do have like little things that happen in persuasion by austin but it, i don't think it's anywhere near like what you have here um i think in a lot of ways we expect uh, especially in something like a sci-fi or a fantasy book, we're expecting a larger plot to be happening and the romance to almost take a back seat to that. So I think it would be hard to write a story like Jane Austen is writing in this setting in the 21st century. I just don't think that would ever happen. The writing style is different, obviously. Um, not like you do have, it's told in first person, so you're only getting Leo's perspective. Um, and it the voice is obviously very different i think one of the things i noticed the most is that here i think alexa dunn tries to give leo a lot of 21st century strong female agency and i 100 percent understand where that's coming from however like i addressed in my cinderella story or cinderella video I think that there's this perception that women hundreds of years ago didn't have agency and it's not that they didn't have agency necessarily it's just that they had to take it in different ways and so I think in a lot of a lot of times I appreciate what people like Austin were doing by showing the power that women could take or what how limited they were in their options and then like it's almost like Anne's choice to pursue a relationship with Wentworth is almost braver because it's such a bigger risk for her than it would be in like this story. Um, but really that comes down to personal preference. I didn't hate it, um, but it felt like Leo was kind of just the same heroine I've read 50 times this year in YA fantasy and sci-fi, you know? like. I didn't think like she brought anything new and special <laughs> to this story. Um, I will say, uh, as an aside, I don't think this really pertains to it being a retelling, but I probably wouldn't talk about this book in any other setting. Um, there is a ton, well, a ton, might be dramatic, but there is some diversity in here. Um, there is a lesbian side character. I actually really liked her. She was awesome. Um, and they talk about um, this concept of this like dating extravaganza, but like what if you're not straight, which I appreciated. Um, so there was some representation in here. I feel like there was more, but now I like can't remember what it was, but I'm like pretty sure there was more. <laughs> um, so I did really appreciate that. And I like, it, it was like a very subtle inclusion. Like this is just part of our life. These things happen, all of that. There was societal commentary on like, different classes and everything and I think you see that a lot in Austin um so that was good so smash or trash I'm gonna say smash like this isn't my favorite book and I wouldn't necessarily rec I wouldn't not recommend it but I also wouldn't recommend it um but I think you can see where Alexa Dunn got her inspiration and you can also see where she chose to make things her own and that's what I'm looking for in a retelling to know whether or not it was a good retelling and like I have said 50 million times in videos I'm sure not every book is for every person and not every book is going to be like a five-star read for every person like that's just a fact of life um and I will definitely appreciate a persuasion retelling because there are not nearly enough of them so that is great. Still like Alexa, I own another book by her and I will read it. Don't think I'll read The Ivies, which is her new release for 2021 because it's a thriller and that's not me, but I wish her the best of luck and you should definitely check out her channel. All right, I think I need to change how I'm doing these videos because one, I think they're kind of boring. Um, and two, um, I can't read this without talking about it as I'm reading it. Um, I'm on page 126. This is not a good book for me, but that's fine. It's worth it. I am loving it just as much as I did the first time. I was honestly a little scared to read this. 
Um, because I remember it having such an impact on me, and it still does. I keep, like, almost crying, and I'm... It is giving me all of the persuasion feels, and I feel like now, knowing more about why persuasion makes me feel the way it feels, I can see even more of what she's doing in here, and it's just beautiful, and it's heartbreaking, and the scenes between Kai and Elliot are just perfection oh my gosh I'm obsessed also I'm pretty sure every time I like when I was reading this and every time they said Kai's last name I definitely thought it was Wentworth or at least that's what I thought in my head which makes sense right but his name is actually went forth which I assume is because he went forth in the world because they pick their names and like there's letters and stuff between Kai and Elliot from when they're kids. Oh my gosh. I'm like crying and I'm like half crying because like my eyes are just like allergies and also just like emotional. I haven't actually like cried while reading it. I've just teared up a little bit. And I get this like feeling in my chest um, when I'm reading this. It's just like this like anxious, angsty feeling and I just want to like hug these characters and tell them that they belong together but they need to grow um I honestly I think I remember things because this is kind of like a dystopian post-apocalyptic story although I feel like I remember like not everything is really fully explained um like some of it is kind of open to your interpretation um it's also really interesting to read this because um you have the Luddites, which are um, Elliot's people, and they basically weren't, like, they don't really like technology or anything like that, hence the name, I'm sure. And they survived this, like, dystopian situation because they didn't embrace technology, and the technology and, like, genetic modifications kind of, like, destroyed people, but now you have, um, posts who like Kai is a post um who are kind of like newly developed so like whatever it's kind of complicated but not. anyways but so you kind of have like it is a caste system but it's almost it's basically a slavery system it's not I mean like it is like um and having I actually just not related to this video at all. I just read An Extraordinary Union by Alyssa Cole, which it takes place during the Civil War and has slavery in it. And it's kind of more obvious, I feel like, after having read something that is so specifically about what we understand as slavery. Um, and it makes it, like, even harder to read, in a way. Um, also, you know, perhaps a little unsettling to read about people playing around with genetics and genetic modification and stuff and the potential downfall of that um when like arguably scientists are doing I mean scientists are like always doing that really like this is not exclusive to corona but obviously like you know MR I hopefully this doesn't like get me dinged by YouTube like I'm vaccinated I'm not afraid of the vaccine. Please, YouTube, don't hate me. Um, but, like, mRNA technology is new, and it is something, or it's newer, and it, it's something different. And, you know, it. there is always the potential that something could go catastrophically wrong. Like, you can't plan for everything. Um, so, that's a little unsettling, <laughs> too. But, it is what it is. So, yes. Okay. Let me go back to reading some more and cuddling with the Murphy cat. Oh, somebody is being meowy. What? What? Can I have a kiss? Thank you. Oh, wait. So, I finished for Darkness Shows the Stars. I actually finished it a few days ago, but... 
haven't updated it. So, oh my gosh. This book is still like perfection. Perfect. It is, in my humble opinion, one of the best YA fantasy or like, I guess it's not fantasy, sorry. YA like dystopian post-apocalyptic books. I, but I like don't even put it in that category. Like it is, that is what it is, but it's not like other books. It's a lot quieter, I feel like, which apparently is something I like in my fiction. Um, so, you know, and it is probably the best persuasion retelling. Like, that's just what it is. Um, it is very obviously a persuasion retelling. Um, you have a lot of the same characters, the same plot points. Like, there's, like, a cliff scene. There's the letter. Oh, the letter is wonderful. It has like this, I think I might have said this in the first clip. There's like a tension in, hold on, I have a, there's like a tension in Jane Austen's persuasion that is there. There's like this level of angst because of secret and the brokenheartedness between Anne and Fred and Wentworth. And that's here too. And she does, um, Diana Peter Freund, Freund, friend, she does this thing where she, uh, between most chapters, not all of them, but most of them, you will get letters between Kai and Elliot and, sir, thank you, um, from when they were younger. And they're not chronological, they'll happen, like, from... When they were very young to like when they were separated at the age of 14 and it gives you this like character building it gives you world building like in such a beautiful like seriously as a book it's wonderful more people need to read it um and I think if you like persuasion I would 100% recommend it like I think it stands on its own but you also see the persuasion elements to it and you can see how inspired by persuasion it is. And also it's very, like, it's very much like persuasion in the level of, like, steaminess. Which, like, it's YA and especially the YA of that time, there was, like, no steam. But there's, I'm going to tell you this, you guys just to like give you a heads up there's like one kissing scene and it's very minor and I feel like that's just not something you see a lot in YA now which I'm fine well I would prefer more I think but here I think it works perfectly and it feels like it fits in with the Austin story and oh my gosh it still made me cry it was beautiful so smash or trash smash obviously I already said it was like the perfect persuasion <laughs> retelling <laughs> so not a surprise okay sorry I played with my hair like this whole time that's what happens when I have my hair in a ponytail okay okay now we're gonna talk about recipe for persuasion and I'm gonna continue to just do this like vlog style I think this works better it feels less forced to me um so I'm like 180 pages I think I am listening to this on audio this time and so I have called her Sonali Dev the whole time I have known about her. I swear that's how they said her name on the Smart Bitches, which is now something else, podcast. And they've had her on the podcast. So I 100% believe that that is how she pronounces her name. Because I don't think Sarah Wendell would make that mistake. Like, she would definitely ask. And I think Sonali Dev would have corrected her. But... The audiobook narrator said it a different way, which I can't remember what it was now. And while I don't think audiobook narrators are always correct, um, I believe the audiobook narrator is Indian, and so I feel like she would be more inclined to get it correct. So now I'm so confused about how to say her name. <laughs> um, but this is a reread. Oh. 
I read this last year when it came out. I had gotten an e arc for it, but I had also purchased a copy because I really like Somali Dove. So <laughs> I want to support her. Um, and I did give it five stars last time. Still to be determined this time. We'll see. We'll see. Um, I am really enjoying it. Um, it is about Ashta. And so this is, um, Sonali Dev has a basically Austin retelling series. I did talk about Pride and Prejudice and other flavors in my Pride and Prejudice video. And this year she has a Sense and Sensibility one coming out, um, called Incense and Sensibility. I've only read Sense and Sensibility once and I remember not liking it. I have no plans on rereading before reading Incense and Sensibility. Um, Pride and Prejudice and other flavors was quality. It was great. Um, and I remember liking Recipe for Persuasion. Obviously, I gave it five stars. But I also remember thinking that it was kind of a weaker retelling than Pride and Prejudice and other flavors were. Not a weaker book, a weaker retelling. And I have to say, so Ashna is kind of our main character. It's not told in like a singular POV, but it is primarily from Ashna's point of view. And she is related to Trisha, who was the heroine from the first book. Um, and it's she's her cousin. And so you do see a little bit of Trisha and DJ in here. And Ashna lost her father. Definitely content warning for um, suicide, talk of suicide in here. Um, so her father did die by suicide when she was younger. And I don't remember everything, and obviously I don't want to, like, spoil things for you. And she was in a relationship with Rico, and they ended up splitting up. And now they're meeting together again. Her father's shop, uh, restaurant isn't doing well, and she's the chef there, and she wants to keep it going because she feels a lot of responsibility to her dad. Um, she felt deserted by her mom, and uh, her dad was there. Her parents had a very toxic relationship. And so she wants to keep this restaurant going. And she ends up going on this, like, reality TV show. It's like Dancing with the Stars, but for cooking. And so a skilled chef is paired up with a celebrity. And um, the guy, Rico, is a professional soccer player. He was injured, and so he is on the show, and they're paired up together. So they're having to, like, reassess their relationship. Or, like, re-see each other and deal with the fact that they split up a while ago. And there's a lot of baggage there. Rico has a lot of built-up angst and anger towards Ashna. Um, Ashna's family is wealthy. And he thinks that's part of why she, like, left him. Um, and I think that that's a very strong part of the persuasion story is the the anger that the Wentworth character has um I don't think it's something I always think about but it is there and sometimes it can be hard to read like sometimes when you're in Rico's head like like you're kind of in his head or you're like seeing what he's doing like you're kind of like dude you're being a jerk but at the same time you're like from his perspective like this girl broke his heart and like, you kind of get it. But I will also say, as I'm rereading this, I think this book is more complex than I initially remember it being. Um, I'm going to need to go through, obviously, till the end to really decide if I think it's a good persuasion retelling or not. But I think Sonali Dev does this thing where she really plays with things. I think I said this in my Pride and Prejudice and Other Flavors one where you almost, a lot of people said it was like gender bent and how I understood why people would say that, that Trisha was more of a Darcy character and DJ was more of a Lizzie character, but they also both had characteristics of the other character and like it wasn't as cut and dry as a lot of retellings are. And I think that's the case here too. And there is this storyline with Ashna's mom who's trying to be a part of her life. And Ashna has a lot of bitterness there. And you learn a little bit about 
her mom's past and maybe why her mom is the way that she is. And I do remember a lot of this story to me really being about her and her mom and less so about the romance. Like where I was almost like, I wouldn't consider this a romance novel. Um, and I almost feel like potential spoilers, but I need to talk about this. I'll like put a spoiler warning up if you don't want any like close to spoilers. I almost feel like her mom's story is also a persuasion story where she is kind of forced into a situation she doesn't want to be in and now she's living with the consequences of that and you're seeing like even longer term consequences than what you ever on persuasion and it's like this multi-generational look at what these things and like what society can kind of pressure you into doing and what family can pressure you into doing for a variety of reasons whether they mean well or it's just for image or whatever and so I think it's really interesting and thinking about it that way it's kind of like is it a better persuasion retelling than I originally thought it was? I don't know. We'll have to keep reading. We'll have to see. It's definitely super angsty. Very, very angsty. <laughs> um, but I am enjoying my reread. I think the audiobook narrator is doing a great job. Um, so yeah, let's get back to it. Right, Murphs? Okay, so I finished Recipe for Persuasion. What? Do you need love? Is that what you need? Do you need love? Uh, so I finished Recipe for Persuasion. And um, I don't think I have much to add, honestly. I mean, this book is still five stars. Like, I still think it's an amazing book. And it was less... So it was equally emotional this read but differently than the first time like I definitely remember crying the first time but I think this time I well I didn't cry that's not a thought I know I didn't cry but I think it's because I was prepared for it but it's still very emotional um and I feel like last time I connected more to Ashna's relationship with her mom than I did the romance and this time I felt more of the romance um I did really like the audiobook narrator I can't remember if I said that before. And I still, so Sonali Dev is definitely playing with the persuasion like themes and just Austin themes in general, I think here. But I think this is even less of a retelling than Pride and Prejudice and other flavors, like I said before. Um, I still think it's a beautiful book. And um, I highly recommend it. And I do recommend it if you like Persuasion. I think you would still really appreciate it. Um, oh, don't fall down. Um, and everything. But it's even more of its own thing. And I think she changes it a lot. So that being said, Smash or Trash? I'm going to have to give this one a trash. Now, this is where this whole video concept, right, is kind of complicated because I'm not talking and I'm never talking about whether or not the books are good or not. I think this came up when I did Beauty and the Beast, when I talked about When Beauty Tamed the Beast by Eloisa James, where like, I thought that book, I think that book is very good. And I think it's a great romance novel. It's great. But I don't think it's a good Beauty and the Beast retelling. And this, I think, is great. I think it's an even better book. Um, I think it's a beautiful book. I would recommend it to, like, any contemporary romance reader. I would recommend it probably to a lot of women's fiction readers. Um, the romance is there. There are some sex scenes, but they're pretty minor. Um, but there's more to the story than just a romance. 
um which I know some people like I don't care I'm there for the romance but I know that bothers some people so I think this would appeal to more people than just romance readers and I would still recommend it to people who like persuasion but I think it is a different story and it's not quite a persuasion story and I think I don't know like maybe my opinions on this will change in the future because I'm sure I'll read this again at some point and like I said I think she's playing with the themes and she's making them her own but she goes so far here that it, I feel like calling it a retelling is just too strong I would say it's more like inspired by um and yeah so like trash doesn't mean it's a bad book or anything like that. Um, although, like I've said before, not every book is for everybody. Bad reviews are good. Good reviews are good. That's fine. I did a whole video on why you should read books I don't like. So, like, and why you shouldn't read books I do like. So, obviously, like, you know. But, yeah. So, trash. But still a fantastic book I highly recommend you read. I should probably film this during the day, but... I'm not going to ignore the trash. Well, it's not really trash. It's like a box of cupcakes and exercise equipment. Anyways, moving on. Yesterday, I watched Persuasion, the 2008, I think, version, um, which was made for TV. I think Persuasion has only ever been made for TV. It's actually on Passion Flicks right now, so that was awesome. I didn't have to pay for it. Um, I had seen this before, but I didn't really remember it. I watched it in college, either shortly after it came out, or I took a Jane Austen seminar. Um, I might have watched it, like, during that, because we had to read every Austen, and then I'm sure I, like, sought out movies or something. Um, and that would have been 2010 that I took that seminar, so. Um... Yes, sir. Could I help you? Oh, hi. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I thought it was a good movie. It's shortish. It's like 90 minutes or so. Um, and I think it's, I was gonna say slow. I don't think it's slow. I think it's very quiet. I think Persuasion itself is a very, sir. Sure. Persuasion itself is a very quiet story and I think that's why it's not frequently adapted or like retold because I think especially how we tend to tell stories now it doesn't like line up with that like those concepts and stuff. Yeah so I liked it but it definitely I also think a lot of persuasion is like you almost in like Anne's head or in other people's heads and kind of like seeing things and I'm not sure that translates well. I don't think I've seen the other adaptation ever before and I am planning on watching it uh hopefully this week. Sir what was that? What did you just what are you knocking down? Um so we'll see how I feel about that one. Um but, um, what was I going to say? I don't even remember. I'm sorry. The cat distracted me. Um, so we'll, oh yeah, I think I was talking about the other adaptation and if I think the same will stand. Um, through a lot of it I was kind of like, I was enjoying it, but I wasn't like obsessed and like I'm going to rewatch this all the time. Um, but I think the last, like, 20 minutes were really good. Now, that's when things get a little more exciting. Um, I don't think anything in Persuasion is, like, super dramatic or super passionate. But, like, it is, but it's not. Like, I don't know how to explain it. Like, I feel like, like, Wentworth's letter in the book is, like so strong so passionate but it's not passionate in the way that I would think of like Pride and Prejudice being passionate it's a much quieter passion and that's just who Wentworth and Anne are like they're just quieter characters 
and that's not a bad thing um but I think it definitely doesn't lend itself to adaptation really well um so the end is when you get a little bit more of that like driving plot that maybe you're used to um you have characters doing more like you have Anne doing more you have Wentworth doing more I think maybe like you know Anne she kind of just like exists in life and I don't know like that doesn't bother me like that's who she is that's kind of like the point and then at the end she like finally makes the choice to like be with the man that she loves and she gets that second chance and and he takes that risk again with her and everything I don't know so the end was beautiful so beautiful I loved it um there's parts of it that were a little like sometimes I think of persuasion as being like a very angsty read and I think it is and it, it gives you like good angsty feels but and I think they were trying to do that in the movie towards the end with like her running like all over Bath. But like to some extent I was like, this is just going on too long. Like maybe we speed this up or something. Um, and then the kiss, like you can draw out a kiss for tension and then there's what this movie did. <laughs> Where it was just, like, so drawn out. I was like, mm, maybe you've gone a few seconds too long. I don't know. Uh, if you've ever seen it, let me know what you think. <laughs> so, I don't know. Was that... I don't really know what I just said. Like, if all of that made sense. These videos have, like, completely gone off the rails. I'm so sorry. But, yes. So, those are some thoughts on the 2008 version of Persuasion. I do think it's a really good adaptation. So, Smash or Trash. I'm going to say Smash. I think it's a really good adaptation. I think it's very faithful. I think it has a lot of the same tone as the uh, book. Like, a lot of the, the vibes are there and everything. I don't know what my cat's doing. But I don't think it's going to be a movie that, like, somebody wants to watch all the time. Like, even as a persuasion person, it's not something I'm going to find myself re-watching constantly. Um, but I would recommend it, and especially if you, like, already have passion flicks or something, definitely check it out. Uh, if you don't have passion flicks, check it out. Big fan, not sponsored, obviously, but I am a founding member, and I like it. If you're wondering, two of my favorite movies, originals on passion flicks, are The Matchmaker's Playbook and Wicked. Um, but definitely recommend that and it was great that um persuasion was on there so next we watched the 1990s version of persuasion and see what we think of that one i had all these plans to film this during the day so it wouldn't be this like yellowy color oh, yes sir come here um and maybe, like, not have all this nonsense behind me anymore. But then I took, like, a four-hour nap today. So, this is what you get. Anyways, so last night I watched The Final Persuasion. So I can finally edit that video. It's probably going to take forever. Anyways, so I watched the, I think it's 1995 version of Persuasion. And while I was watching it, there was moments where I was like, I think I have seen this before, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, I got it on Amazon. I had to rent it for like $4. Um, and I think it's almost two hours long, which you can feel sometimes. I'm going to be honest. Like as a movie, I think sometimes it kind of dragged. And I don't know if I was just tired at one point I was like, oh, I think I may need to just go to bed and finish this tomorrow. But I ended up finishing it. Um, sorry. Um, so, I don't know. But that's just it as a movie. Um, it's a pretty traditional, like, period piece, I feel like, movie. Um, it, like, the other persuasion is and like the original I think I said this in the other video um it's a very quiet 
movie so it's not super like action heavy or anything and there's like they don't there's not a like they don't add a lot of drama like with the music or anything um which I think is fine but I think it's not something that necessarily people might be used to especially from traditional like uh, movie theater movies maybe I don't know maybe that's just what I've been exposed to but and it said it was filmed like when it opens it says it was filmed on location which like I don't really know what that means like it's not like this is a real story so I don't whatever and filmed with natural lighting which I think is very interesting I don't know a ton about movie making but I think it's interesting I will say something I actually really appreciated was it didn't feel like the characters were like or the actors were like made up and that is actually something that kind of bothers me in a lot of like I'm gonna call them Hollywood period pieces where it feels like these actors are wearing tons of makeup and it's not that makeup didn't exist then it did it didn't exist in the way that makeup exists today obviously different um formulas uh different ways it was created, that kind of stuff. Um, there's tons of things you can check out on YouTube if you're interested, like Bernadette Banner, um, Abby Cox, they've both made some videos recently about uh, historical makeup. I'm sure other people have too. Um, and everything. But, and I also understand that in movies, especially in most movies, you're under very heavy lighting. And so, these actors have to wear makeup to some extent because otherwise they're probably going to be washed out. They're not going to look natural um, and things like that. It's kind of like, it's slightly different, but it's similar to if you're performing on a stage, you're going to wear very dramatic makeup to make you look normal to people from the audience. So, you know, like if I'm in a dance recital, I'm going to be like super over the top because from very far away under very harsh lighting you need that over the topness for me to look like I have eyeballs and a face and actual definition and everything but sometimes I feel like it's very unnatural and it does kind of bother me so I did actually really appreciate this here it felt more natural to the characters and natural to the times um, and like somebody like Anne, she's not probably going to wear a lot of makeup um, because that's just not who she is. Um, no shade to wear makeup at any time. Much respect to people who do that, but she's just not a character who would wear makeup. Anyways, but on to more about the movie, I guess. So I did really enjoy it. I actually would consider purchasing it. Um to watch it in the future I'm just not like really into watching movies right now so I don't think I would do it and I think I would re-watch this one before I would re-watch the 2008 version although I do think the 2008 version was very good um and I definitely like sorry my alarm went off I definitely like the Wentworth better in the 2008 version than this one he's a little more stoic in the 2008 version <sighs> although I feel like there is I started thinking about it because I was like oh I don't know and I was like there's who he is with Anne and around Anne because he's like bothered by their past relationship and how she treated him versus who he is around other characters and so I think I always have like the Anne Wentworth in my head and not the other Wentworth so I wouldn't say it's unrealistic or like a poor version but you know I also never fully felt the chemistry or the tension between Anne and Wentworth in this one although I think the actress who played Anne did a very good job and you could really feel like her pain and her sadness and everything it just like the romance wasn't quite there for me but I still think it was a really good movie um I feel like that sounds like it would be awful <laughs> but I did still really like it um I liked a lot of the acting in it I think a lot of the actors and actresses did a really good job 
and they did some really interesting things. There's this scene at the beginning when Anne goes to the Musgroves, and it's just, like, each of the Musgroves, like, complaining to her about other Musgroves, and you just, like, see her just, like, I don't know. It was beautiful. I loved it. That scene was funny. It was, like, very subtle humor, but it was funny. I really liked it, <laughs> and I think it, like, added a little something. I don't know. I feel like there was more I wanted to say. I should have just filmed this last night right after I finished, but I was so tired. I just wanted to go to bed. I think the girls that played Louisa and Henrietta were really good, too. Those actresses did a really good job. Um, I don't know. I guess that's it. So, are you going to? Okay. So, smash or trash? I'm going to say smash. So, that is good. Would recommend. I'd recommend both of them. Honestly, both adaptations, I think, were really good. I think they each did something better than the other one. Um, I don't think everyone will love them, but I think I said this in the other adaptation uh, video. I think Persuasion is a hard story to adapt and to retell. And um, I think the people that Persuasion works for, it 100% works for. And the people who don't like it just aren't going to like it in probably any iteration. And that's fine because you're allowed to like what you like for whatever reason. Um, so, yeah. Thanks for, oh my gosh, are you going to fall and break something? Jeez, okay, let me go and take care of the Murphy cat and maybe this stuff. I'm kidding. This is 1130 at night. I'm not taking care of this today. But maybe tomorrow. Thanks for watching. So those are my thoughts on Persuasion and the Persuasion retellings and adaptations. If you know of any other retellings or adaptations, feel free to leave them down below because I'm definitely interested in more of them. Um, and thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye!